That's good, man. Rock and roll, Jetty. Good to see you, man. You too, Dave. Thanks for uh, agreeing to sit with me, dude. Part of the reason I, I thought it would be great for us to sit together is that I love your thought life. Every time we get together, you have a really dynamic, uh, explosive thought life. And so I thought, as I've been doing some of these, these podcasts and sitting with some really dynamic people, you obviously came to mind that there's a lot of stuff. We talk about this when I've sat with you. There's a lot of stuff in your head that I think the world should hear because I think you have a lot of value to add to people uh, and to leaders. And so I, I ended up writing down a few questions um, recently that I thought were perfect for you, right? <laughs> meaning they're complex, they're dynamic, and they're unique. Uh, and I think it'll be really good for you to, <clears throat> excuse me, for you to answer those. Uh, but before we get started, why don't you just tell us, just give us a snippet that you would give somebody else about who is Juddy. Tell us who, who you are uh, in any way you want to tell. I mean, it can be who you are personally, who you are professionally, some of the things you've done, some of the valleys you've crossed through, some of the hills you've climbed over. It doesn't matter. Just if, if you wanted somebody to know, hey, quick highlight, who, who am I? Uh, it, it could be anything. You could just say, hey, just, I'm a dad. It could be anything you want. But what would you, how would you give the narrative on this setting? Yeah, well, well, thanks for saying all that, David. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. We've, we've had some fun conversations, and it's, I'm looking forward to this very, very much. But still, I, I appreciate you saying that stuff when you do. And I need to have my wife around more often uh, <laughs> when you say that stuff. <laughs> no, so... We'll play it back for her. Yeah, we'll play it. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, we'll start. I'm, I'm in the garage, so I'm an adventure rider i've been riding motorcycles since i was four and uh i lead a private club have for five six years now of guys and take them all over the southwest and down into baja you know unsupported rides which means we carry our own tools our own fuel our own everything mm -hmm. and we go get we get, we get rugged you know yeah. baja 1000 if anybody listening knows that stuff that's the kind of stuff we go we go play on dirt so, bikes you guys are all riding dirt bikes, dirt right? bikes yep. heavy adventure bikes okay. uh, we don't mess around with the street very much at all uh, and the great thing about that I learned is it it gives you a way to get out into a completely novel environment where you don't know what's coming, but you got to be paying attention to it. Mm. So you talk about getting into flow. You talk about having to focus. Otherwise, stuff can go bad quick. Mm -hmm. That's where it is. And you're doing that for three, four, five, seven days at a time. Mm. So you really get to experience a heightened sense of yourself here and now in the present. Yeah. And we have challenges every day. We've got serious challenges sometimes for guys to get through, whether it's injuries, whether it's self-doubt, whether it's holy cow, we're staring down a cartel guy with a rifle and a mask. That stuff happens down there, right? Yeah. So we, we get pressed into those places and then we come back out and we massage in and out on the trail. We're having conversations and at night we're, we're bonding like brothers. Yeah. And it, it has shown to be really transformative for many of the guys that come and do this with me yeah. every year. So that's my heart. That's my fun stuff. Yeah. And uh, what kind of pushed me into that was for the past 15 years or so being a professional coach for executives, leaders, founders, etc. So I have conversations with guys and gals who are in the heat of trying to navigate a really ascendant life and stay connected okay. with themselves, with their family, but also actually lead, not just manage, not just boss, not just direct, but lead people that are on their teams mm -hmm. uh, and that's where I spend my life playing in that place yeah. uh, I got into that because I had to do a lot of that for my own executives and for my own salespeople. Um, I used to be the head of a real estate development company mm -hmm. then we handled everything from our design to our marketing to our brokerage yeah uh, the whole ball of wax yeah, yeah I did that through my 20s and early 30s and had a lot of fun with it it was a yeah. really great time yeah so that was kind of the, the, the short arc from entrepreneur to coach to adventurer and almost professional conversationalist. <laughs> That's true. Now, the, now, now the, just for those that don't know who you are, I think in some of our previous conversations, uh, if I'm not mistaken, your development company was a nine-figure business, right? So it's not like uh, uh, you weren't just a guy next door building houses, but you guys had built something of... Something that would I think most people would would dream of touching, uh, and I say that to say you've you've been in spaces that people dream of being in, uh, for some right. Yeah. And, and if I'm not mistaken, that was nine figures we talked about, which for some people are trying to get to their seven figure mark. Others are trying to break to eight figures. You've touched the nine figures, uh, and and inside of this reinventing yourself and helping others uh, is the space where you're really at right now. Is how how you can make a difference in other people's lives, right? 
Yeah, that is that is true. We yeah. uh, I, I had a a very fortunate run. It, it was not all skill. Yeah, at all. Sure. Uh, it was a very fortunate run, and 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 we had a a really good time. I think I was running at at peak uh, five projects in three states, and uh, about fifty employees that that were doing that with me. Yeah. Um, tremendous amount of fun. Really great time, and that sort of transferred into you know as I mentioned, my my clients typically tend to be eight and nine figure business yeah. owners. So, you know, we've, we've typically gotten past the absolute ground floor zero to one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, now we're working on that, that one to infinity range. Yeah. So that's the place that I've been having a lot of fun and, and, and working with, like I said, guys and gals who are in that place of, wow, I, I pushed really hard and did some amazing stuff on my own or with one or two people. Sure. But now I have this growing team and I have, leaders that I'm supposed to lead and how do we, how do we bridge that gap and keep the right energy in it at scale? Yeah. So those conversations and how you stay connected to who you are, who you want to be spouse, if you have it, kids, if you have it without breaking some of those yeah. beautiful relationships. Yeah. I grew up in the desert. Uh, and so we played on dirt bikes and quads and sand rails and old Honda buggies and cool things like that's what we did is just played in the dirt, right? Where there wasn't a lot of life. There's a lot of dirt. Uh, and that was a lot of fun. You could still look at the map of the house we grew up in in Apple Valley on Moonbeam. And if you look at an aerial view, it's still carved out the corner. So we had a hill in front of us, right? We lived at the base of a hill. And then there was a, a road that went up the hill and cut into the square. And at the corner by our house, there's probably like I don't, 150 feet of just dirt where plants never grew. And that's because as kids, we used to jump on our quads <laughs> and try to see how much of the back end we could get yeah. coming whipping through. And we did that for years, right? You know what I mean? Until really you're driving backwards, you know what I'm saying? Whipping around that corner. But still, if you look on it from a mountain, I mean, from a map view, from, from like an aerial, it's still completely carved out. It's just this gigantic open space that we ripped to death when we were kids. And so connecting with being able to be out in, in the desert, getting out in nature, riding, you know, getting on a bike. And when, when we were young, my, my dad loved horses. We had like a ranch uh, and they always wanted me to ride horses. And I said, I'd rather get on, you know, 15 or 25 horses than one. I don't want to get on a horse. I, what I want to do is get on a bike. I want to get on a quad. I want to get on something that, that, you know, brings that adrenaline and that thrill. And so I love hearing the story. I don't, I don't, I will circle back to some of my questions, but one of the things you're saying really sparked a thought for me. There's a, there's this huge, like, movement right now uh, and I love some of the people I think it starts with the uh, the what's his name the Wim Hof movement where people are like yo get in ice crush your body do something difficult uh, and then it seems like man if there isn't a thousand ads running across my page of a group of 15 people right getting in an ice box pushing themselves somewhere in the desert it almost feels played out at this point it's like who else is going to get some guys put them in an ice box hike a hill. It just feels like, come on, you guys. It's like, get creative. But I, what I love hearing about what you're doing with the Adventure Club is that it takes me back to something that I loved, right? Because I've mm -hmm. done some of these groups with some of my friends who run those groups, and we show up, and they're fun. Don't get me wrong, man. Like, somebody says, hey, we're going to go, you know, hike 16 miles today, uh, and it's going to be up 6,000 feet. Or I'm like, all right. <laughs> like, Let's do that, I guess. You know what I mean? It's a challenge, and it wears me out, and I have to get intentional, and I have to focus. But I don't hike if we don't do that, right? But growing up in the desert and hearing, like you said, that we face, you out there, you said we face challenges every day. There's going to be things that came our way. We're going to be out there for a duration of time, high pressure. You likely are going to run into situations that are going to require you to think on your, you know, think on, the, on your, your feet, keep your head on a swivel and still make it out alive it's to some mm -hmm. degree. Sometimes like sometimes it could be I'm not trying to make it sound like your trip is where you're sneaking coke through nah. through Panama. That's not what I'm getting at. But yeah. it's still everybody that thinks of Mexico does not think of the Caribbean. It's a different challenge down there. And you're going to run into people that have different intentions than you do, possibly. Yeah. Depending on, I know you said there's some trails you guys can avoid all that, but then there's some trails that when you want to see certain things, you've got to get in that space. You've got to get in that space, and, and it's constantly evolving. And, and one thing about Baja, a lot of people have horrendous ideas about just how dangerous it is. Sure. And, and that's not reality. Yeah. Some people have ideas that it's the safest place you'll ever find, and yeah. that's not that's exactly not reality, reality either. either. Sure. It, it's, it's closer to the safe side, okay. especially when you're off-roading. You know, off-roading has been such a such a critical component of their economy for years. There's a, there's a legend around off-road riding, you know, the big trucks, the motorcycles, et cetera. So when you're down there 
getting dirty and you're out in these weird wild places you know yeah. coming across private ranches yeah. where they'll throw you a cold tecate and maybe pull wow. some gas out of their their tractor if you need it right wow. like yeah. you you come across authentic good humanity got it and you're mostly going to be left alone but but every once in a while you'll come across something that requires you to you know stay in your head and That's it's, good it's interesting to yeah. see how people respond to that i mean yeah. Your, who, who you are at home mm-hmm. is still there. Yeah. It's in a different environment, yeah. and, and you got a different le- level of hormones, and you've got a different intention for your day. Yeah. But when you get pressed into that state of overstress, right? You yeah. know, under stress, stress, overstress, some of those things come back out, sure. right? You know, yeah. you are who you are no matter where you are. And in that environment, it gives us a place to work through that stuff. And it, just as a super simple yeah. surface example, we've got one buddy that uh, when he starts getting hungry, Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and it took us a few times to realize what's happening here. Yeah. What's happening? But it was really that that strain of, you know, I'm getting hungry. I don't know where I am. I don't know how it's going to be till food. And food in the evening is, you know, shelter. And I'm I'm really tired, and I don't want to be doing this anymore. And it just yeah. it cascades, and we don't necessarily recognize when we're at home or in the yeah. office how these things will cascade on us. Sure. Yeah. But it's uh it's under a magnifying glass out sure. there with a dozen other dudes or half a dozen other dudes, depending on the size of the trip where we are. And all of a sudden you start seeing people yeah. come un- undone. Yeah. You know? uh, we were back in the middle of nowhere, um, down around Mike Sky Ranch up near uh, El Coyote Ranch. And we had a guy with us. He was a, a police officer from a, a very big city. Mm-hmm. Dude's been shot. Mm-hmm. We're back there on motorcycles and he, he had a couple of hard falls. And let his blood sugar get low, right? You got to maintain that stuff. Otherwise, weird things happen. Mm-hmm. Right on the trail, blood sugar going way too high, which mm-hmm. happens to some people, or way too low, can cause real problems. Well, yeah. his blood sugar got low because he wasn't keeping his snacks up, and all of a sudden, he stepped out of his mind. Mm. Threw his bike down, started gathering up tumbleweed. I'm not going another freaking step. I'm wow. sleeping right here. And I'm wow. like, with the rattlesnakes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're gonna, yeah. <laughs> start a fire with wow. tumbleweed and just sleep on the trail you can't do this yeah so it took a couple of hours and and sure. some real effort to get that matter solved and once we did you know i was thinking my gosh i took this guy too far yeah. he's probably going to hate me do i need to worry about a lawsuit and by that evening once we were safe and the pressure released even after we found out dude had three cracked ribs yeah he was the happiest i think he's been in wow. years wow years yeah because he got to be pressed up against meltdown yeah, and then have a, a group of brothers that brought him through it, talked sure. him through it, didn't call him out for being all these shameful judgments we do to ourselves or other people do to us and was able to stand back up and be like, holy cow, I, I made it through that crazy yeah. shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, you did, dude. Yeah. And he, a Superman. Yeah. Wow. Rode out the next day with those cracked ribs stopped for drinks at the end of the, at the end of the trail and went on to the hospital. Wow. Wow. <laughs> It's, you guys, you guys debrief those moments. Like we'll just stay here for a little bit. You guys, so 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 somebody has a meltdown. Somebody didn't get enough food. Somebody's freaking out because they feel like they're running out of gas, and fear starts mm-hmm. rising up, and they start creating these these thought patterns that are fear casting towards the direction of how are we going to make it? I don't know if I can ride up that hill. All of these things. When you guys end the night, are you guys debriefing and recapping? Absolutely. Like, yeah, tell just lead us through just a moment of that of like. Of how you guys are able to capitalize on those those opportunities in order to bring growth and development because I, you're right getting out there in a high stress environment it's one thing if we're in the office right and we're in this big structure this this construct of you know enterprise and we're feeling these pressures where i'm amongst people where they i'm supposed to be leading right so i can only at least in some of our philosophies I can only be at a certain measure of, um, I can only have a certain measure of exposure here. I can only reveal so much of this honesty and transparency. And some of it I have to muscle through. Some of it my mind is freaking out as a leader, but I've got to muscle through. And I can't actually share with you people that I don't think we can make it either. You know what I'm saying? Like in, in all honesty, like half of our job in crazy situations when we accomplish great things as leaders is convincing ourselves that we can do it anyhow. Mm-hmm. Because most of the time when you see something that is, uh, you know, something we're unfamiliar with, we're, we're asking, we're poking holes. We're wondering how it can even happen. It's different. Maybe it's a change in process or something at work. Maybe it's a, 
in an organization or structure and they're going to flip this thing on its head and you're getting a new boss which you didn't know how you were going to work with that boss but you can't share that right so you're in a you're in a breaking season lots of pressure almost compacting compacting in with a lot of density but you don't have a place to decompress because what are you going to do you're going to go talk to the person you're unsure where they're at so a lot of people can feel that way where out on the trail you're not at work and some of those people you don't maybe know uh, they don't know you. They didn't grow up together. They're just out here saying, hey, listen, Someone I need for the this. First time. Yeah, some people are just coming out there, jumping on their bike. Some people are just learning how to ride these bikes, right? They're mm-hmm. maybe getting refreshers on the bikes. Uh, but at the end of the night would be the perfect opportunity for somebody to say, man, this I've, I've felt this before, but I felt it at work. And then you guys have the opportunity to coach them through that. So you can just lead us through one of those evenings that you guys are able to, to take advantage of that. And not, not to to give it all because I think people should experience what you guys are doing, but just give us an, a, just a short snippet of what a night looks like and not necessarily the how, but the what you guys sure. are able to accomplish. Sure. And, you know, on that point that you said to go back into the office, you know, there are conversations I have with a lot of folks about, okay, well, what do you do in that situation? How do you handle that? But stepping back from that in terms of how you're experiencing this, but continuing to stay engaged and continuing to move forward you know, whether you're in the office having that wrestling match or you're out on, on the trail, the side of a hill mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. and all your electronics have, have gone kaput, right? Because mm. that's happened. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, the inclination to catastrophize is the inclination to catastrophize. That's inside you, mm. whether that's happening at the office or in Baja. If you've got an inclination to catastrophize based on how much clarity or certainty you have or don't have right and those are typically the two things Mm -hmm. if we have high certainty we tend to know how things are going to work out we don't catastrophize but Mm -hmm. if we have low certainty and or we have low clarity right Right. because a lot of times especially as leaders you don't have a lot of certainty sure you got to have an internal clarity you got to know what you're up to you got to know what you're what you're heading you you have to know your objective right Mm -hmm. I may not know how this is going to turn out but i'm real clear about how i'm going to show up and what we're going to do yeah so certainty and clarity We break those things down. But if you've got low certainty, um, that's usually enough for most people to start to fill that void with mm. catastrophization. Mm-hmm. And that shows up out on the trail. Yeah. When we roll into the evening, the guys that went through that, cause, and usually it's, it's more than one per day. Yeah. The guys that went through that, that's the first thing they want to do. They want to talk about that stuff. Because yeah. Yeah, yeah. we just rolled into Mike's or we just rolled into Don Eddie's or Coyote Cow's or some beautiful, wonderful, rugged place, and they immediately come out with cold beers or our favorite margaritas, because they, they all know us down there, right? Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, everything you've been carrying that just felt like, shit, I might not make it. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, total yeah. purge. Wow, well, yeah, it's good. <clears throat> and the first thing they want to do is jump into, oh my God, I didn't think I was going to make it, holy cow. And the neat thing about that is it's short cycles. Where at work, sure. you might have a six-month run yeah. before Where the high pressure we won, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. With this, <clears throat> by the end of each night, you're going to have that ultimate release. Yeah. And I don't want to say it's a party, but it's a good time. It's feeling good. You know, you're yeah. putting the CBD pain cream on the joints. you got a cold beer coming in. You know where you're sleeping that night. Everybody's yeah. safe. We're yeah. working on the bikes, repairing whatever went wrong, and we're preparing for the next day. Yeah. And in that place, it's just an elation, right? So yeah. the meals over dinner, the meals at the little bars, wherever we have them, the meals walking the beach or hiking a little trail because sometimes we feel like you know wasting more energy after we're done for the day. Yeah. In those places, the conversations that come out are guys talking about the experience that they had and how it shifted things. Yeah. Because they got to see on a short cycle, real intensity, yep. making it through, and then real release. And in no part of that was there any sense of shame or abandonment or judgment mm. coming from the rest of the crew. Yeah. Because we literally are all in it together. Yeah. Nobody's going to get left behind, yeah. and we don't advance yeah. without all the brothers. Sure. And that place, it's, it's, it's really wild. So I had one guy several years ago. He's an ex-fighter pilot. Um and he just, I mean, he goes for it, right? Yeah. This dude attacks life. But he said, you know, do you guys talk like this to yourself? Like every time you almost mess up or you almost have a crash, or you almost jump off a cliff. And he just goes on this tirade of how he cusses himself out and just cuts oh. himself left oh, and right. And I'm going, 
No, yeah, man. No, no, <laughs> I don't have any of that yeah, in my head. Yeah, yeah. How do you survive yourself, yeah. right? So being in that space, we also get to hear how we're going to be talking to ourselves sure. and have a direct contrast sure. to these other people. So it is almost like, and this is how coaching kind of does work in the real world, they're incentivized to bring this awareness out mm. and have a place to talk about it in a, in a place of excitement, camaraderie, no judgment. Yep. And they get to wash their own stuff out in the open because they're hearing themselves say things that they've never heard themselves say yeah. based on thinking thoughts that they've never been in a spot to think. And the cool thing about being out there is that your testosterone is way up. Your cortisol may be up too, sure. but it releases quick. Your testosterone is way up. Yeah. Like you have hormonally a different chemical yeah. state in your body, yeah. but you're still thinking a lot of the same patterns of thought. Yeah. And being able to have a really intense experience that triggers all these old intellectual patterns, but deal with them in a different chemical environment yeah. with people around you who are of the same spirit, yeah. it really is like getting to do a deep, intense wash on self-talk, perception of self, perfect perception of challenge. And ultimately what we want to do is reduce that inclination to catastrophize, both yeah. on the trail, because that'll get you hurt. Yeah. And then when we take it back home in real life, yeah. it, it's pretty organic. Yeah. Dudes want to talk about it. And me being a professional coach for nearly two decades, I mean, I'm right there to create the space to listen. Sure and come in strategically when we need a nudge yeah. or we need another open door. Yeah, I feel like I feel like uh, all of that is beautiful. Let me let me grab that shot of tequila. Let's let's uh <laughs> there you you know, go. Let's, let's just This is this is what we do a lot in uh, in in Baja. It's yeah. talk about life and then get shots of tequila. Talk about life and get shots of tequila. Yeah. yeah. Why not? Cold tecate and tequila in Baja I is love uh, is pretty amazing. Not not from the standpoint of we're down there to drink because that's yeah. not it, but understood. Sometimes you just, just a little line. a yeah. little touch take the edge off. Gets people talking and being open, you know? Mm. I don't think we needed the talking and open today. I think we we got that right now, but uh so so I want to cycle back to one of the things you said. We talked about a guy down there, because I think I have two thoughts here now. Uh, you have a guy down there who, who says, hey, do you talk to yourself like this? And I've often found that that's a reflection from the past, right? The noise that often echoes in our head, the voices we hear in our head are often an echo from the past. Seldom are they uh, the vo your own voice you've developed, which happens to be highly critical. And if it is that you had a support network, whether that was your parents or your coaches or whatever, and everybody was for you, and your brain says you're always going to fail, uh, then I think that you, as an individual, need the help from people that can help rewire your thought process so that the language you use towards yourself becomes that of an overcomer, that of a champion, that of one that wins, that of an encourager. And I think we do that by programming our language of how we speak to others first, right? Seldom, though, is it coming from other people. Oftentimes, I find it's likely the way your parents uh, spoke to you. Maybe it was the way his dad spoke to him. Maybe his dad was a hard-driving coach, and he was always, he, that, that's how he felt. At a highly impressionable point in his life. Right. Typically around a potentially traumatic experience. Sure. So that's how he's wired to hear that voice. Right. Because he believes it produces a greater outcome. Even if it's not a true reflection sure. of who his dad was or who right. his dad became. Sure. But, you know, a lot of times... These, these intersections that create real anchored perspectives and beliefs, they happen around moments that you can say are traumatic. Of course. And we call them traumatic, but really they're intensely yep. impactful, yep. right? And just like one of the best ways to create some of these locked in anchors of negative perspective mm -hmm. is in moments of trauma or moments of high emotional uncertainty or sure. threat. Sure, Baja creates some of those same experiences. Well, that's great. Yeah, so it starts recreating the opportunity for impression on the mind to start Highly to rewire. Highly impressionable situations. It's really good, yeah. Where you get a completely different level of programming right here, right now, and it's real I life. Love that. It's not conceptual. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It, the pressure's up. It's like you said, it's yeah. real chemical change uh, that the high, high intense situations are creating new pressures and your mind is having to adapt. 
And I never even considered the idea of a high pressure environment in order to rewire a previous high pressure. Cause that's a great point. So, so you may have been at an impressionable point, maybe say let's, you had a coach when you were young, who was a terrible coach. Uh, but that coach knew yelling and screaming and uh, I would say borderline or abusive language that really cut people down because he felt like that was the way or she felt like that was the way to motivate you up. Probably he had a few top performers in his career sure. that that worked for them. Sure. But that only works for a few types of mentalities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say, candidly, if I have to choose between the two, I'm not going to choose at tearing you down. I think that I think that we get far more through the the encouragement i think there's an honest confrontation that we can use but also like you said at a young age we're getting pretty far off track here but at a young yeah. age but just just to get to, to put that back in in the in the mailbox here so it, you may not have had a very hard traumatic life but somebody you looked up to at, at a time where it was very critical where you were needing praise and you were very maybe the individual was sensitive or there was an emotional moment where you were hoping for praise and the coach or the dad or the uncle or the grandpa or somebody in your life laid into you and it really stuck. Yeah. Not necessarily that they were terrible people, right. but that's the moment that it, that hurt became so real because in the moment where you were, when you were looking for the, either the comfort and protection or the praise and you got opposite, that became the signature moment. And, and there are three layers to look at there. Uh, you know, one, the situation, it's an intense situation. There's a high degree of uncertainty and there's a high degree of pressure to perform, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, situationally, good. intense, uncertain, gotta show up and perform. Yeah, well. There's somebody there who may or may not have become more concerned with an outcome mm or with an image or with embarrassment than they were for actually speaking into and raising this child. Yep. Right. Cause parents and coaches, they get a little too intense on certain things sometimes sure. and they forget the primacy of this relationship. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So second level an outside authority figure who is there to speak into you got a little too attached to something other than pouring into you. Yeah. And then third, you being a kid or being in an emotionally immature state or being in this situation of, oh, it's intense, it's uncertain, I gotta show up and I don't know what to do and this is just so much. As, as kids, especially adolescents, we don't necessarily know how to make sense of what this other person is going through to allow grace for them. We don't necessarily know what's our fault, what's not yeah, our fault. Sure, you know, how many sure. kids come out of divorce relationships thinking it was their fault, right? Yeah, like, sure. It, it's really difficult to be young and process emotions in a healthy way. Yeah. So if you take that situation, intense, uncertain, got to perform, somebody around you that you look to either as a father figure or a brother figure, and then being highly impressionable, yeah. Pick that up, put it into an adult situation. Go create the same thing, except now the brotherhood around you, the guys around you, the leader that you look to yeah. knows how to keep that space for you, knows how to speak into you, and knows how to give you what you need to properly process this stuff to step up and perform in uncertainty with high intensity. Yeah. That type of reprogramming, because we're so vulnerable. Good. Yeah, it's so good. It's an adult reprogramming for adult situations that helps cut off bad programming when we weren't mature enough to realize that that was bad programming. Bro, it's so good. I love, I love the, the, the language you're using to, uh, to introduce the concept here to us, which is first understanding the breakdown and situationally like, or circumstantially, where are the breakdowns that took place and then creating an environment that's opposite of the breakdown with greater understanding of how to, to, to operate or to respond differently so that you could get a different outcome. Because I think a lot of times people will take a, a certain situation and just be like, well, that was bad, we've got to do better. But it sounds like you have a lot of, a lot of understanding around where the failure was at and then, and then maybe some of this was just by happenstance and maybe some of it was by design and maybe both, but it seems like creating and programming an environment that will allow you to rewire those, those negative spaces and the way that you've articulated that is, is really beautiful and helps us to understand even at a greater level where your understanding in that space is. So, so and it leads me to the, the next thing is that I, earlier I was saying in business, and believe it or not, there are some people out there who are crushing it at business and they show up and they deliver, 
But then they go home, and maybe because there was some of this trauma that existed in their life, so at work I'm everything to everybody, maybe for this person, this, this guy or this gal. At work they're on fire, and, they, and, and the family goes to a work event, and here's how their dad or their mom is always showing up, and they're the greatest thing. They're like, that's not the dad or mom I have. Who the hell is this person? I, I literally had somebody say that, that they went to their dad's retirement party, and it caused a divorce, bro. I'm not playing around. Literally, the parents I, I, got divorced after like 30 some years. I can believe that. Because they heard about how great he was at work. And they said, well, who in the frick was this guy? Like, it, it went straight to divorce after that because they couldn't believe that he had been so much for others. But some of that I find is that, like, even in my own life, because I grew up with a, with a wild father, bro. The story's too long to get into it here. But, but, but maybe like most people, I have this... Maybe not like most people. My pops is crazy. But just imagine really bad, really crazy. Uh, and then I get to certain stages of my life, and I'm consciously aware in my own development and growth, well, I guess we're on our own right here. There's, I've never seen this. I didn't see it done for me. Because life was so broken growing up, I didn't see anybody do it. So we got to figure it out now. And sometimes the have to figure it out, mixed with the sincere care that you have for an individual uh, can almost be paralyzing because you don't want to mess it up. And a day, I always said, this is this is where the the marriage and parenting goes wrong. It goes wrong every 24 hours. Is it's so easy for us to say today, I'm just not going to address that today. Just I just don't have it. I don't have the juice for this today. I just can't get involved in that today. And then tomorrow it's like, are you going to deal with that? Uh, in your head, you're like, I'm going to let it slip. I'm just going to, I'm going to watch that it'll get better. And then a day turns to a week, weeks turn to months and months turn to years. And the whole thing has slipped. Now you've lost relationship mm -hmm. and connection. And it wasn't like, some of it is sincere. I just didn't know what to do. And I became paralyzed inside of that. And so I don't want to, I don't want to pretend that we're only going out there fixing business problems. These are things that will, that can reinstate confidence. Cause I often feel like we're building equity in ourselves when we do difficult things like that and we overcome them. When you go down and build equity, you go down and be building equity as a father or a mother and then come home and say, I could overcome those challenges. I can figure out how to talk to my kid about the things that we're indifferent about, or I can figure out how to bridge the gap between my wife and I or my husband and I so that we can, we can close the gap that most people often sincerely want to close and are just staring at a wall. Yeah. They need this, this overcoming that leads to the, the self-belief and the equity to know, like, I know it's difficult, but I've overcome something difficult, and I know that it's just an imaginary roadblock that I'm creating, creating fear and then paralyzing. So uh, I think that what you're talking about, I limited it to, to work in our first, my first mention, but I, I could see how it would be so helpful in all things, even for uh, a father son to go ride together that's maybe had difficult connecting and then bonding through difficulty and then rewiring and, and making new memories that were difficult and even oftentimes in those situations one of them would not want would not be all in but after something real difficult that they accomplish and conquer together they can really create new bonds which will wire new you know new patterns in the mind of of memories and and emotional signatures, as I call them, of bonding and, and connectedness memories, right? I just have to ask, is is this topic, because this is a big one. Sure. Is, is this the one you had teed up that you nope. wanted to bring? Okay. okay so no, bro, believe it or not. <laughs> we're probably not going to get to whatever it was that you <laughs> yeah, wanted, because yeah. what you just brought up is it's very gigantic, new, yeah. And it's huge. Yeah. Um, and, and it's absolutely a, a common situation for men and women. Yeah. To just be badass, mm -hmm. uh, and let's face it, you know, if you are a leader and you've got a, a significant group of people who look to you as a leader, and you're good, right? If if you're if you're badass, like you succeed, you get stuff done. People yeah. follow you. Yeah, you can pretty much bet that those people have a sincere connection with you. Yeah. And that's what comes out in that retirement story so much. Yeah. Stories accumulated over the trials and the triumphs and all that stuff mm. that really does bond people. Yeah. That the family at home didn't get to see. Yeah. And wow. one point about that, that family wasn't a super healthy, awesome, this is perfect, it's beautiful, and then they went to one retirement <laughs> no, ceremony I got it. I and got it blew it. apart. That family was holding on yeah. with teeth and nails. Yeah. And then that just yeah. broke it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a real common situation where people orient their identity with what they do yeah. for money. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, with how they're seen by the people who follow them sure. in a production or performance environment. Yep. And you know, one of the models that I use to cut through a lot of that stuff real quick with leaders to, to both recognize how to see and pour into their high performing team members, but also themselves and their family is, you know, there's, there's, there's what we produce, mm -hmm. the thing that we deliver that the transactions happen around, whether it's a service or product or whatever, there's the way we show up and produce that stuff. So there's our production and then there's our performance. Yeah. Literally our self-expression, how we show up and do what we do in pursuit of production. Yeah. Beneath the level of production and performance is a person. And the person is usually the place where most of the challenges in performance and production are rooted mm -hmm. because that person is not experiencing a host of different things that they might not be experiencing in the way that they want. Yeah. And they may be really good at, and, and this is a common buzz term right now, imposter syndrome or um, you know, fraud simplex or whatever, sure. where, where people show up one way and yeah. life looks good and everything is wonderful but then they know the truth or yeah, their yeah. family knows the truth. Sure. Really common divide. Yeah. So I'll step back a little bit. In, in development, one of the things that I realized early on in my 20s and, and then up into my early 30s with our client list, you know, and we, we developed properties that were second home, third home, retirement, gated, amenitized communities. These, these, these were, you know, our, our clients were spending a, a significant chunk of money to create an anchor somewhere other than where they lived. Yeah. And so many of the conversations I had with people throughout my whole career ended up kind of tying back into this theme of we've made it, mm. but somehow we've become disconnected from our kids. Yeah. They now have their own kids. Yeah. And with this gem of a property down here, yeah. We can have a real anchor to incentivize our kids to come down and visit on the weekends or vacation with us and bring the grandkids. Yeah, sure. So this second, third property becomes an incentive to bring the family back together. And I heard so many conversations because I was young when I got into yeah. real estate. I was young. So I, I heard all these conversations about you remind us of our son yeah. or you remind me of me. Yeah. And then yeah. I would hear these cautionary tales. Yeah. Don't get lost. Yeah. Don't get lost. You'll regret it. You know, first divorce, second divorce, right. estranged kids. I heard, heard all this stuff. And once people had made it, right? And these are baby boomers largely. Yeah. They'd made it to the point of we're considering retirement. We have disposable income. I can afford to buy a second or third home. They're, they're really doing it, trying to recreate a home environment yeah. for the next phase of their generational family. And it was about reconnecting yeah. over the mistakes that they had made. Yeah. Wild, I won't go any deeper into that, but that was that wild. Is it's really hard to pass that, right? <laughs> like topically, I saw the same thing when I was young. I saw leaders that were on multiple divorces that were trading their time yeah. uh, for money. Uh, and, and everybody young had this idea, it's going to be worth it. I'm yeah. building it for us. Just it's hang like, on. Yeah, Just I, I did that. I did that. Uh, so did I. <laughs> but I did that looking at it saying I didn't want to be them. Now, I didn't do it to the extent they did because I anchored myself to the belief system that I was not going to be like them. I was not going to, and I say be like them as in I wasn't going to quit on my marriage. Mm -hmm. I, I understand that people have challenges in marriage. That's not what I'm getting at. Divorce is not the failure. But the point that's another was, topic, but that's it's right. real. The, the point was is that I, I was not not going to be the cause of the failure. That's what I had determined. And so when we would come to those places, I knew I had a belief system and a benchmark on the inside of me that knew my plumb line would put me back towards family as the priority. And over the years, the muscle of family has grown so thick, you can't fight it. Anything I do is to support the current unit, not the future unit that someday, don't worry, I'm gonna, we're gonna have all that money and then you'll bring your grandkids back and then I won't know you and I've gotta get to know your grandkids. And then I've seen that cycle, so now I have grandparents and their kids who don't get along and the kids there's an animosity between the triangle because the kids are like i don't know why all of a sudden you're showing up being a great a great dad because you you weren't even there for me and now you're going to be this and i yeah. didn't want to be around because it's so hard for me to watch how beautiful you've become and i missed all of that and all i wanted was your time i just wanted you to show up to a baseball game dad or i just wanted you to come to my volleyball game dad and you didn't come and now you, you got all this time and money you act like everything's okay we're not okay because there's that disconnect that grew. Mm -hmm. um, that's a real thing that takes place. Yeah. Now we'll put a pin on that. Let's let's save that for our future. Yeah, it's big. It's big, and it goes yeah. back to something you mentioned a little bit earlier, which is so many of the conversation I have 
conversations I have with leaders or or high performers trying to get to the next level, we go down and we start at the level of the person. Yeah. And that means spouses. That means yeah. family. That means, you know, one of my clients loves to tell the story is, you know, I said, all right, well, great. So what do you want to, it was in the beginning of our, our, our relationship. And I said, well, okay, so we've got the lay of the land now. Now, what do you want to, what do you want to talk about first? And yeah. he said, well, I want to talk about this situation at work. And all right, great. So let's talk about your wife. Yeah. Because that was the situation. And, and he says now to the day, the reason it's a funny story is because that was the pin he didn't want pulled. Yeah. And yeah. that opened the door to just an amazing arc yeah. that he's been on. So in the development world, I started hearing all these stories. Those were my yeah. clients. And yeah. obviously I was very young when I got into development. I was very fortunate. Nearly all of my employees were older than me and all of my clients were older than me. So I got this exposure to that sort of 45 to 75 year old experience after they'd gone through all the things that were still in front of me to do, right? Sure. When I transitioned into professional coaching, the bulk of my clients at that time, right out of the gate, tended to be the 45 to 75 year olds. Sure. So I got to dig into that, work on that. You know, now I do still have some, some you know, 60, 50, 60 year old clients, but, but the bulk of my clients right now are uh, early 20s to yeah. mid 30s. Just they're still on the rocket, right? Yeah. They're still building it and taking it. So we get to do a lot of preventative work for those guys. And it's so sure. funny how often our conversations will start to dovetail into the real root of a performance challenge and the real root of a sense of I'm not being authentic, I'm not being true to myself. Sure. Or because you can tell, mm -hmm. you can tell when you're planting seeds today for highly dysfunctional relationships in the future. Oh, sure. You sense it. Yeah. And it unsettles people. And when by who you, are you mean the individual. The individual. Operating there yeah. knows. I skipped that. That's going to yeah, come back. I'm headed. And, yeah, the, right. and, the, and the folks who are really... You have yellow alarms going yeah. off in your head. All of us, right? And, and young yeah. people tend to be pretty attuned to that. They just yeah. don't know what to do with it. They don't yeah, know how... Like, what is this intuition that I feel? Yeah. You know? So yeah, yeah. we pull that and, and we avoid... My dad used to call them stepping on landmines. Yeah, no, you know, We avoid the landmines as much as we can. Yeah. And the cool thing about that also, my dad used to say, you know, you can get away with making one mistake. Yeah. Sometimes you can get away with making two mistakes at once. Yeah. You get to the point that you're layering Repeating them. three yeah. or more mistakes in a given situation yeah. on motorcycles or sure. in the boardroom. It's start the game all over. There's going to be a problem, no right? Doubt. Yeah. So it, it, that kind of creates a little bit of a space because a lot of high intensity, high performance men and women, they make one mistake and they want to slit their throat. Yeah, it's like, sure. whoa, whoa, whoa. No, come on now. Sure. So a space for grace and possibility is one of the things mm. that I talk about a lot in my, in my client work. But back to your 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 question or you know one aspect of that question is creating that divide between how i show up for myself and yeah. my family and yeah. how i show up for myself and my team yeah and and that separation and yeah. you know let's just talk about highly successful people who yeah. are leading teams yeah. they're highly successful for a lot of reasons and one thing that's kind of common with highly successful people i have learned is that they can get away with a lot of stuff at mediocre effort. Mm. Because for whatever reason, there is a talent that expresses itself in the path that they've chosen. Yeah. Yeah. And that can come in at home when you say, ah, I don't wanna deal with that today, I'll do it tomorrow. Wow. Uh, I'll deal with that next month. Wow. We can get away with a lot of stuff in yeah. life because certain things just kind of work out for us if we leave it alone. Wow. And that lulls us into this false sense of, I don't have to deal with it, I don't have to put sure. intention on it. I don't have to go build some muscle around that because it'll probably just work out. But the yep. thing with kids, it doesn't just work out. No doubt. Rarely ever. No the doubt. thing with a, with, a, with a partner or a spouse that yep. is looking for more intimacy or yep. feels abandoned, it rarely just works out unless yep. you've got somebody that is a saint yep. of patience, yep. right? And yep. very few people are willing to say, hey, let's hang up 20 years of good connected living. Yeah for some future that might have more financial security. Yeah. Very few people will actually consciously make that bargain. Yeah. So when we kind of step off the gas and assume things will work out, and we're not doing it because we're assholes. Sure. Sometimes we're doing it because we're overwhelmed. Yeah. We're beyond capacity. Yeah. We just don't know what to do. We're afraid of that situation. We can go be badasses at work because that's fairly easy, but at home, what if I screw up my kid? Like just sure. whatever the dysfunction, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, beneath every dysfunction, there is a, a dissonance. Yeah. I'm thinking one thing, I'm doing another. I'm feeling one thing, I'm thinking another. Right? Sure. So dysfunctional on the surface, beneath every dysfunction, there is a dissonance. Something yep. isn't lining up. Yep. And beneath every dissonance is a point of divide. It really is. There is a point yeah. 
where the experience shifted, the thought shifted, the belief shifted. There is a point you can track back to where everything that cascaded from that led to this. Sure. And that's why we have to chase these things down. You mentioned earlier, is this by design or is it by happenstance? The, the best designs yeah. come from the most universal happenstances, right? Yeah. You encounter it, you experience it, you don't know what to do, but you don't shut off. You figure your way through it. If you're lucky, you get to do it again, maybe with somebody else instead of your own life. And you start to see the pattern of how to navigate that through. Yeah. When it comes to these types of things, it's really important to be able to say, and let's not use the language too harshly, dysfunction, right? But this is not producing the fruit that I want it to produce. Sure. Therefore, whatever is leading to this is not functioning correctly. It's dysfunctional. Yeah. Call it out. Yeah, yeah. No judgment, no harshness. Just call it out. Yeah. This is not the fruit that I want. What's going on beneath it? Well, I believe this. I want for this, but I'm doing that. And I know that does not lead where I want, but that's yep. what I'm doing. Well, why? And that's where it starts to get tricky. And that's why I say there, you have to believe in a point of divide because so much that we produce that it, you know, goes one direction different than what we, we say or what we want comes down to the really messy layer of what we believe. Yeah, sure. And so many times sure. people have never actually spoken out loud. Yep tried to articulate what it is they actually believe. Yeah. They just have this ghost whisper of belief, Yeah. but it's not held to account. Yeah. There's no fire beneath it. There's no yeah. intention beneath it. Yeah. So if, 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 if you're willing to call out a dysfunction, go down to the level, start peeling it apart, not be afraid of what you see, and intentionally push down to, there is a point of divide yep. that leads to this dysfunction, and I can find it, and I correct it, and I want to. I can yeah. do this. Yeah. A lot of times, that's like, turning the light on in your kid's room and all of yep. a sudden the monster disappears. Yeah. Just looking for it. Yeah. Makes the beast yeah. flee, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. It's wild. This is, you couldn't have offered me a better segue to my actual question, right? <laughs> you literally could not have offered me a better segue. So I have three, three things that I've written down that I believe, you know, uh, organically have worked themselves out or maybe not organically, maybe it's divine on why we're at this point in the conversation. I wrote something down uh, the other day when I was at church, it hit me in the language that I that that I wrote it in, uh, and and I knew we would get an opportunity to talk about this when I wrote it down. This was a we're going to talk about this topic, uh, and you're the perfect person to talk about it. And this is what I wrote. So I want to address this is what I want to address. Right, perceived notions in social constructs creating real pressures in fabricated thought-driven spaces. I'm going to give that give that again. Right perceived notions from the individual in social constructs being work, life, home, uh, enterprise, whatever it is, uh, creating real pressures, often stresses or self pressure that we're driving in fabricated thought driven spaces, meaning like how do, how do we resolve these? It seems like a lot of what we're talking about right now comes down to perceived notions and social constructs creating real pressures in fabricated thought-driven spaces, meaning that, that somewhere inside of me, I've got a belief system that I am using as my truth or my center. I'm, I'm then processing my thoughts through that place as it applies to the social construct, which is either a group, my, my church environment, my, my workplace, the business I own, my home, whatever that is. Uh, and, and, and then the fabricated thoughts that I've created on my own from the center of my belief system, which maybe is rejection, maybe it's shame, maybe it's not enough, maybe I hear the voices of, but whatever this cascading thought is that works its way down to everything I do, that then paralyzes me from the necessary movement that I know in my, in my knower and know it in my core of my being that in order to see change, I've got to execute X, Y, and Z, but then you can never get to X, Y, and Z because the pressures it's creating uh, either have you set to the fear of failure or the fear of success, but at the cornerstone, that, that perceived notion grows up to be fear. It's like everything you plant in the garden of your thoughts turns into fear and then paralyzes you. How do individuals deal with that? So I'm going to read it one more time. And I know you listened very carefully twice because it's a complicated thought, but just, I want you, I want you to just kind of talk about this perceived notions in social constructs, creating real pressures in fabricated thought driven spaces. I think that that's, that's a space that almost all of us humans deal with. And, and many people become paralyzed by 
uh, including me and you. We've mm -hmm. all been we've all been really impacted by something like this. How do you coach somebody to get through something like that? And I think it's I think it's been a perfect segue leading us right to this deep thought. So, you know, now we're dealing with a with a with a real hypothetical. We're not talking about things that have happened in the past and offshoots from it. We're talking about okay, this setup is oh, real for sure. a lot of us. Yeah, when you so, say, and when you say hypothetical, you mean we've created a hypothetical situation of an outcome that's possibly in our head? Well, or? no, what I mean is a little, little different than that. In a lot of my coaching relationships, people try to give me hypotheticals. And okay. They want me to deal with a hypothetical. And I'm like, okay, that, we could deal with a hypothetical. That'd be super fun. But sure. why don't we get to the real? Let's put names on this. Sure. Tell me who this is. Tell sure. me this situation, right? Because it was talked about earlier. Yeah. Our inclinations to do certain things, whether in the boardroom or in Baja. Yeah are our inclinations to do certain things, right? So if we can pull one instance up and dissect it, a lot of times that is the combination for all these other situations. So if sure. we can just get to one real situation with sure. names, yeah. as opposed to a hypothetical that could apply to anything, we are stronger in a one-to-one -one client coaching um, pursuit of success, sure. pursuit of changing the outcome, pursuit of good results, right? Yeah. So what I meant by that is, now you've kind of come into this sort of hypothetical client situation instead of us talking about different things that we experience or what's Baja like or this or, well, that cascades into this. You know, we've been talking about just a lay of the land. Yeah. This is the first real, hey, now here's a situation. Treat yep. me like a client. Sure. So in that regard, the first thing I want to say is, okay, now we're talking about real people. Yeah. You're talking about real fears, you're talking about real heart things, real mind things, real situations, and that becomes way more delicate. You can't be flippant or glib about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I say that is because I'm about to be a little bit <laughs> flippant. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's a, there's a real concern for the weight of what you're talking about there. And I mean, when I do the work that I do, I'm either on the phone or a video conference. Mm -hmm. I'm not on a mountain somewhere in Baja with people, right? Mm -hmm. So the bulk of my professional time is exchanging words. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting because most of the words that we're exchanging are trying to find just the right hyper-complicated combination to perspective and belief about the words that they're not exchanging mm. in their own experience of their life. Sure. So this is highly intellectual trying to find its root in emotion so we can shift belief to create a different set of outcomes, to perform differently, to produce different results, right? Sure. I take that so seriously. Like this is life yeah. that we're talking about yeah. and making yeah. somebody's life better. Yeah. So at the depth of what you're talking about is a real experience there that, that deserves to be honored and we will. But coming back up to the surface, the way you set the question up, the situation you outlined can very flippantly be described as Bro, you're having a lot of conversations with yourself and you're sure. making a lot of limiting assumptions about other people. Sure. Right? That social structure, Agreed. this perception that I have. And that tends to be the ultimate root. Yeah. One of the things that I see as an outcome from the leaders that I work with is that they end up real world. Yeah. 360 loop feedback, real world. They become more vulnerable. They become bolder and they become more willing to initiate conversations yeah. to get to the root of what their people are really feeling and what they're really feeling. Yeah. And the cascade on the feedback ends up being, oh gosh, they just, they're leading like they never have. Yeah. Like we're going places yeah. we've never had, right? Because that's, you know, first principle is leadership. Yeah. Somebody who's going someplace other people want to go to. Yeah. If you're a boss, you can tell somebody what to produce. If you're if you're a manager, you can tell somebody how to how to proceed through a process, right? Yeah. But if you're a leader, yeah. you're moving in life in yeah. a direction and people are choosing to follow you. And we won't go deeper into sure. that, but that movement yeah. from real leaders is felt by the people around them. And typically that shows up in conversational spaces where we're talking about things that are more important to us in the context of what we're here to do together, right? right. So we're still objective oriented sure. for what we're producing. Sure. But now we're connecting at that person level rather than performance or production yeah. about the things that are guttural,ly important, yeah. right? Yeah. We're getting real with each other. Yeah. And I say that because a lot of what you're talking about 
you framed it as in these situations where I'm making a lot of assumptions about other people, sure. about the dynamics at play, sure. I'm not necessarily having conversations <coughs> with them or I'm not having conversations that are meant to be directed. Mm -hmm. I'm having surface level conversations where I'm actually not saying the things I really want to say. Yeah. And as a result, I'm harvesting all this relatively weak data yeah. and I'm processing it all in my own mind through yeah. my own lens and I'm not getting good counteract. Yeah. I'm not getting the real word from the people I'm dealing with yeah. and I'm not getting the truly open non-judgmental space of grace to process things through that I would normally give somebody sure. because typically we don't give other people as much grace sure. or rather we don't give ourselves as much grace as we give other people. Right? Sure. Yeah. So it ends up being a, a fairly confined, confined intellectual conversation yeah. that you're, you're not even hearing yourself talk this stuff out loud. And one of the things I do with clients is like, hey, you can't get a hold of me all the time. Sure. Right. When you can't get a hold of me, yeah. pause for a second, think about some of the conversations we've had, go stand in front of a mirror and talk to yourself with yeah. the same amount of care, love, honor, and excitement for who you are yeah. that I would. Yeah, yeah. And people talking to themselves in the mirror sure. is yeah, yeah. magic. At least at that point, you're having a, an audible conversation sure. instead yeah. of an intellectual conversation. Yeah. And those well, Audible and visible, right? Audible so and visible. You're connecting with the, the image eyes, of a human. See, yeah. yeah. 100%. And of course, this is a ramp because if yeah. you've got somebody who's having these conversations in in their mind and they're making assumptions about other people, they're making yeah. assumptions about situations, they're making assumptions about their own level of acceptance, power, etc. in this dynamic. Yeah. First step, begin to have an audible conversation with me in a different place, yeah. in front of the mirror with yourself, but get that ramp going where you're saying this stuff out loud and you're having a chance to, to refine and reframe a lot of what's going on. And then ultimately you end up having some very different conversations with the people around you because the only way to change potentially incorrect and limiting assumptions about the social environment or the production environment around you yeah. is to go do something different in it. That's right. And when it comes to yeah, people, yeah. that's yeah. about conversation. That's yeah. about connection. Yeah, yeah. But a lot of times that is one of the scariest steps for us to take. Sure. Especially yeah. when in our minds we've just got chaos. Yeah. So having someone on your team as a coach, having someone as a mentor, having someone as a brother who's going through this stuff and you guys can look eye to eye and say, dude, I'm wrestling with that too or I wrestled with that last month. Like it doesn't have to be a coach. It doesn't yeah. have to be somebody conceivably at a, at a, at a level above you. It can yeah. be right there with you. The important part is it's a space where you know you can say any damn thing you want no matter yeah. how ridiculous, no matter how much you might make fun of yourself. Yeah. It's a space for you to hear yourself say something you've never heard yourself say before in an environment sure. where somebody's going to say, man, I get that. Yeah. Man, I see that. And just that little space that opens up there makes everything else behind it okay. Like a decompression. Like a decompression. Mm -hmm. Where everything else behind it is okay, this stuff can start coming out. And like I said, when you turn the light on in the kid's bedroom and the monster just goes away, yeah. when this stuff starts flowing... 80% of the time, yeah. the alignment is there, and, and in all the stuff that's coming out, you can see the stuff that needs to be thrown away, yeah. and what's left kind of lines up, and you pull your own strategy together. Yeah. What gets in people's way the most of that situation is their own judgment locking it down before they get yeah. to the gold. Okay, so not everybody, and I'm not say not everybody, I mean, there's six, seven billion people on the planet, right? And we're going we're gonna to release this video, you know, uh, onto YouTube so that people have an opportunity to, to grow and hear the things we're saying. Uh, how, I want you to speak to the, the mom that is, uh, you know, a secretary or a school teacher. Like most of the world doesn't have, uh, you know, necessarily the finances to hire a high level coach like yourself. And they may not even have friends because they've been working two or three jobs. They don't even have somebody in their space. We got a single mom just trying to make it through who's working two or three jobs, who you know gets home just to say goodnight to the kids. What, what, how, do you, how do you provide value right now for that mom that says, I don't know how, I, I need to break out of the situation. I feel the frustration and the tension. I've created fears that if I leave this job or if I do this, the whole thing is gonna crumble. And all they are and all they have is that 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 place in their own head for that person that's saying I can't get to you though I don't have the means I don't have the the the, the connections or the finance to pull this off what do you say to that individual because that's the greatest volume of people that would hear this mm -hmm. that could that would need the change 
The rest of those people we connect with, we drive, we have the coaches, we do these things. But what about the person who says, I'm not in a place where I could actually tap this. How do they like themselves start the process at least? What, what are the first steps that you say to that person? These are the things you've got to start doing right now if you don't have those people in your space, if you don't have people you're connected, you don't have community, you've got to at least start with these, these steps. Uh, and then we'll, we'll have one more question and I'm going to let you tie it off after that. And this person doesn't have a friend or a family member right. that they can go to, right? Yeah. So, I mean, they're isolated. There's billions of people there on the are. planet, you're right. right? So, you're right. so let's help that person right now. Right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it apart in a layer quickly to get to that root so we can talk about what that is. And that's a complicated question, right? Yeah. That, that, needs some more, so that needs some more thought time, some more intention. Sure. And... But maybe some of those people have those people too. Maybe they do. But they don't know how to close that gap right. yet. So how right. do we help get somebody from point A to C? Maybe we're not getting them all the way to W, but how do we get somebody off center right now? Right. The people that are stuck on center, that give us the advice to help, help people get off center. So let's talk about it as empathically as we possibly can quickly. Um, what they're feeling is, is not comfortable, mm -hmm. right? Pressure, anxiety, disappointment, doubt, self-hate maybe shame like what they're feeling first we want to recognize oh my gosh like if that's my child yeah 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 my heart hurts for the life experience that they're having yeah okay but it's important to recognize that that is separate from some of these other things and it, it, i have found that the, the the more we can quickly and simply categorize or differentiate or layer, so I call it buckets sometimes. Mm -hmm. The more we can put things into buckets, the more we can have the space to deal with something as it is, yeah. rather than the whole cascade at once and I just don't know what to do, yeah. right? Yeah. So a lot of the times people get disappointing thoughts, opinions, etc., based on what they're producing in life. I don't have this, I don't have that, I did that, it mm, was wrong, right? Yep. So they're looking at a lot of the things that you might rightly consider external experiences. Mm -hmm. And they're either producing something that is good or not. Yeah. And when it's not, they judge themselves. I, I did something bad, that means I'm a crap person. Wow, yeah, right? that's good. So we want to put that aside and say, you know, what I produce is not who I am. And at the level of- So you of, want to suspend the attachment to, suspend the to, attachment the, to, the to that production, to that Got outcome, it. to yeah. that result. Okay. Because we direct outcomes, mm. right? I'm going to do this. Oh, that was wrong. Do this instead. We, we, and as leaders, right? This is some of the language we use. We, we direct people mm -hmm. in their production. Produce mm -hmm. this, not that. Yeah. You're producing that, but it's not quite good enough. So you need to produce it at this level, right? Sure. So we, we direct people yeah. what to produce. The way we go about that, the performance piece, how we're showing up. Am I showing up happy? Am I showing up bright? Am I mm. dull? Am I getting into flow? Am I creative? Am I bringing a smile? You know, like how I get done when I get done. And oddly, a lot of leaders, well, well, my team's technically hitting the metrics, but I think they could produce at a higher level if they just show up better. Mm. They'd take more ownership, and that's a whole other conversation. Sure. So a lot of times when you think about how we get done what we get done, our performance, mm -hmm. that's where a lot of leaders, managers, etc., want to correct the process. Mm -hmm. So, so many conversations that, that we have corporately as teachers, as programmers, as leaders, as bosses, whatever, are in this world of correct and direct, correct and direct. Mm. And if we focus the bulk of our identity and we give validity to who we are based on the experience of how we show up and what we get done, we're liable to have conversations with ourselves that are strictly stuck in the connect and direct, connect and direct. Well, I can't figure out how to do something different because this is what I know and I can't figure out how to show up in a better way. I'm trying to correct things, but I just, right? So connect, direct, connect, direct. And it's a very transactional, sterile, administrative state sure. mentality. Sure. So the same thing for leaders we talk about to that, to that mom who's a teacher. You gotta break through that stuff, recognize it, write it down, put it someplace intellectually, it's going to be there. You can direct that stuff. You can correct that stuff. It's going to be there. Don't worry about it. Let it go for just a minute and drop down into the, the person, right? Yeah, the yeah. person yeah. that shows up and performs, the person that produces that fruit. That's where we connect. Yeah. So we got to get through the layer of telling somebody to do something different, telling ourselves to do something different. We got it through the layer of telling us that we're wrong. You're wrong. Don't do it that way. You should be ashamed. And we just got to get down to, hey, what are you feeling? Mm -hmm. 
where's this coming from? What mm -hmm. is, we gotta, we gotta connect, mm -hmm. right? So if you don't have anybody to talk to, but you're wrestling with all this stuff, the very first thing is push off all the demands that the world puts on you and that you put on you and that the people closest to you put on you. Okay. And just get out of that mindset of you gotta show up and perform and you gotta produce, you gotta and just back it up. What are you actually feeling? What are you actually afraid of? What do you actually want? Where does your heart actually hurt? Yeah. And tell yourself, whatever it is, yeah. whatever is going on in here, is okay. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's not wrong. It's not bad. You're not going to be punished for it, right? That goes back to something that I wanted to say a long time sure. ago, but we didn't get to. In some of those traumatic events from childhood, a lot of what we incur is a punishment and a judgment. Mm. Whereas adults, we've got to be able to make these decisions without the, the aspect of punishment coming for us. Sure. Right? That's where a lot of the bad stuff keeps hanging on. So punishment aside, all that stuff, we're, we, I don't care what you did. Yeah. I mean, some of my clients have, are, are felons. They've, they've been in jail for murder. Yeah. Well, if I care about this person and I'm trying to help them step into a new place, I can't keep beating them over the head. Sure. You're a murderer, right? Yeah. I don't care what you did. I don't care how you did it. I care who you are as, as a person because you have dignity. Yep. And I want to connect with that and recognize that what you're feeling is real. Yep. What you're thinking is real. Accept it. Work through it. Let it exist. Let it have space. Talk to yourself in the mirror. Write it in your journal. Do something that allows for the articulation yeah. of those ghost whispers inside. And don't be afraid of what you find there. Yeah. Because this is thinking and connecting and speaking out loud and writing. It's not doing. Yeah. We're not performing. We're not producing. We're just connecting with who we are. Okay. Do that first. Okay. And that might take a week. It might take a month. You might hate it. So okay. many people, when I say journal, they're like, no, no. And, and I've got a little hack for that. But you've got to do the work that a coach would do or a good friend would do yep. to hold a space open for you to be real with who you are with no judgment, no shame, and just say, this is, this is the closest to present and real I've ever been in my life, and it sucks, and it's hard, and I wish it was over, and I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. And then stay there until you get to a point mm -hmm. where you incorporate that self yep. back. Yep. And you're no longer using the language of what you did wrong or how something went sideways or how somebody's upset with you. You're only using the language of who you actually are. And a lot of people have never done that in their yeah. life. Yeah. From there, yeah. you can start having verbal conversations with yourself. You can start subtly shifting the nature of the conversations you have with certain friends, certain family. You can start finding room to express yourself more completely and in a more accepting manner with a greater intention and attachment to what you actually want in life yeah. rather than the bad results or negative outcomes that you're trying to get away from. Yeah. And when we can start speaking into pursuit rather than avoidance, a lot of things just start happening for us in a way that you can call divine or magic or universal blessing or favor or whatever. But when we leverage the power of connected pursuit yeah. as opposed to fearful avoidance, yeah. we generally, relatively quickly, start finding ourselves stepping more and more into what I call favor. Yeah, yeah. Like, holy cow. Yeah, it starts working. It starts working. Sure. And generally, it starts working in a space where we're able to give more of ourselves, yeah. which allows us to get more back that honors who we really are at our core. Yeah. But when we're stuck wrestling with what we did wrong or how we did it wrong, yeah. we're stuck in this correct, direct, correct, direct, correct, direct. And I'm telling you like that, it pulls the plug out of dysfunctional relationships yeah. with regard to leaders and teams when that leader shifts into connection mode. And if you're talking about one individual, how do you help that one person that can't have these conversations? Yeah. Well, that one person, you're the leader of your life. You're the leader of yourself. Right. You're the leader right. of your experience. Connect. Connect, yeah. To what is, what is felt, to who you are, not what you've done or yeah. how you've done it or how somebody else has judged it. Yeah. And do it the best way possible without your judgment. And that's yeah. where you're going to st stumble. Yeah. Right? And as a coach, that's one of the things we work to keep that. Whoa, 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 that, that sounded like you're kind of being mad at yourself sure. for admitting reality. Yeah. Like, I'm not mad at you for admitting that reality. Let's hold that back. Yeah, yeah. Let's just let you continue to pursue with what is, connecting with what is, connecting with who is. Sure. Rather than what they've done and so forth. And I, and I, would, I would caution the listener uh, that if you are predisposed and you know you have a history of heading down 
the victim lane and getting stuck there uh, that as much as you want to touch that place and you want to be able to feel, uh, be consciously aware not to spend too much time there. Meaning that if you're a person that loves to talk about your feelings and getting deeply connected uh, and you know, oh, I feel that already. This is not permission to become hard on yourself and go to a dark place. It's just permission to feel, right? It's permission, it's to, permission be honest, to feel it's transparent with yourself and no longer run and avoid yeah. the challenges. Uh, some people will, they, most people I would say will likely be able to connect with that. And then some people that I know who, who wrestle with being very difficult on themselves and not being able to break that programming, entering into the space, this is not a permission for you to, to, to feel down on yourself for the next few months. That's not what it is. It's just being transparent and honest and real yeah. and connecting, right? With Getting, the fact that there are things going on. There right? are things going on and, and Typically, those subtle, emotional, that cascade into intellectual perspectives, emotional yeah. experiences that cascade into intellectual perspectives tend to anchor belief. Yeah. Those are those whispered ghost beliefs that sure. I talk about. And until you say them out loud, you don't really know that they're there. Yeah. So pulling that lens, and again, we're not talking about somebody who's already highly connected, already very self-directed, sure. you know, wants we're to... We're just getting started here. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about people who are struggling. Yeah. People who have some self-hate, people who have some shame, people who feel like... They, they can't speak. Anytime yeah. they start to get real and speak truth, something grabs their throat and chokes so it out, good. right? Yeah. Like that is the person that we're talking about, yeah. how to comfortably get yeah. back into this place of reconnecting yeah. outside of performance, outside of production. And ultimately, nobody walks through this experience alone, right? right? I mean, right. I, I do believe we're made for Agreed. community. 100%. Find your way That's into right. a place where you can have that's conversations right. of meaning of yep. merit where you're genuinely truthfully authentically sincerely connecting with another person sure, sure. who then will do that with you yeah right? yeah that that mutual vulnerability yeah i've i've obviously i mean i, I don't know how many and you've got a hard stop so i do have, a hard, have stop. a hard stop and at this point in my life i think that i've probably worked very intimately with maybe 500 close to 500 people yeah um, so I, and, and, you know, these, these are folks that are successful. Yeah. So I've heard more than once. I don't need a therapist. Yeah. I kind of resent the idea of a coach. This is kind of funny companies paying for it or my wife's making me happen or my best friend who owns another company said, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I've heard a few different ways of putting it. I don't need somebody else mm -hmm. telling me how to do what I do better. I'm smart enough. I'm good enough. Sure. I'm successful. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Because they think it's something. They think yeah. they know something that mm. they don't quite. Yeah. And intelligent, successful people, we do this. Yeah. I got it all worked out. It's just, I got to wait for this or I got to do that. And, and, and pretty consistently I've heard the flip side, which is, you know, I realize now, it's not about finding somebody smarter than me sure. or that's been through it before. It's not a mentor, yeah. right? It's not yeah. a trainer. It's about having somebody who knows how to give me the space yeah. to get real yeah. with me yeah. and to hear the full truth and the full power of me yeah. and to kind of keep the guidelines around, right? Sure. And, and I use this analogy because I used to race motorcycles on the street yeah. very illegally. Uh, if, if you're a high performer, if you're a badass, yeah. and you want to find out just how badass you are, you don't go do it on the street. That's fun. That's dangerous. That's got, sure. You go to a racetrack. Yeah. You, you go to a place that's got boundaries mm. that can be learned, that is going to protect somebody from screwing your stuff. You want to find out yeah. just how far you can push a that's limit? That's really good, yeah. You go to a racetrack, yeah. right? So coaches and conversations and good friends, they help bring about a little bit of structure in the same way that a racetrack would yeah. for somebody to go get wild, go yeah. get, go get, push it to your damn limits. Yeah. But there's somebody there making sure yep. that you don't run off course and crash into a tree or there's a semi coming. Do you see it? It's yep. going to hit right. Like yep. it, it brings a little bit more protection to a space where people are really trying to, push deep into those next levels because at yeah. the end of the day 
wherever we are, whether it's a high level or a low level, if we're feeling that pull towards something's not right, something could be better, I don't like this, we're wanting to advance. We're wanting sure. to get to a way of doing something differently That's than good. we have. Yeah, it's good. Having conversational spaces to do that with people who know how to create that structure and keep you from being your own worst enemy yeah. are really valuable. I love it, bro. I would say for, for anybody that's listening or that will listen to this, that two things are that relationship is about vulnerability and everybody on earth has been hurt in relationship. And so maybe you have people around you, but you're not sure who you can open up with. If you're feeling stuck in that space where you're feeling like uh, that, that piece of relationship is that, that I'm connected to wounds with, so I can't talk to people, that's one of the difficulties you're gonna have to get over. You're gonna, if you're gonna go to another level, you're gonna have to open up again. You're gonna have to be vulnerable and you're gonna have to crack into the space of connecting with humans. Because I agree, this life was not meant to be lived out. We are better together. Our efforts are multiplied. The Bible says one can put a thousand to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. There's a reason our efforts are compounded together, right? Uh, so if that's you and you hear that and you have people around you, but there are wounds, you're gonna have to be vulnerable again. But what I heard was begin to get the language out of your mouth, right? So you can begin to at least program your thought differently. What are the challenges? And when you hear them out sometimes, they, they actually don't make any sense when they make it out of your mouth. You're like, that's not even real. Right. So you can begin to process out loud. If your first step is, I don't have that coach, begin to process these thoughts out loud. Uh, do it in front of the mirror, do it in your car, but get vocal so that you can hear them. And when they're not right, you have to begin to like renounce and break agreements that you've made internally that that's the truth. And when you start to deconstruct that, it will start to lead you to a place of productivity where you can likely connect with the humans around you and start this effort again of where we can be stronger together. Uh, and, and number one, this we had so many things I thought we were going to talk about, but conversation flows so well between us that uh, we talked about a bunch of beautiful things. I love what you're doing with the trail riding, dude. But tell me and tell others, how do people connect with you? So I think you've given a, an amazing explanation and, and just an, like... Uh, you know, a story about what you guys are doing and how that impacts. And I think so many people in leadership and, and in life could use this type of environment uh, in order to go to the next level. Cause maybe most people don't want to get a dunk tank. We have a dunk tank. I hate it. It's freezing. I don't want to do that. I've done, I've done you ice know, baths. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that's not, that's not my jam, but if we were to go to the track, bro, I could probably ride as hard as I could to my, my, you know, you get the shakes. Like I would love yeah. that. And that would feel empowering to me to do that as a team. You guys are doing things like that. This connects with people. It's authentic. It's real. It's not fabricated. I saw somebody do it. You guys are doing something totally unique. How do people even find you? How do they get connected with you in this opportunity? Sure. sure. Hey, before I jump on that, I will say what you were telling to folks, you know, begin that conversation. Get that stuff spoken out loud. Just before that or concurrent to that, imagine the barbed wire that we have around our thoughts. Mm that barbed wire surrounds the idea that you are what you do, you are how you show mm, up. Sure. So sometimes the first thoughts have to be breaking free of using that language of busting our asses because we did that wrong or sure. because that came out wrong or because yeah, yeah. my kid hates me right now. Yeah. Separate from that, get into the person. That goes back to the, it's I good. don't care what you've done. I yeah. love you. Yeah. Right? That can be critical to get the right words out so yeah. you don't just hate on yourself in the mirror. Agreed, yeah. Identity um, issues, right? The, yeah. Yeah. Performance-based identity, production-based identity. Yeah. It, it rips people apart. Yeah. Um, keeps I, and, them, keeps and, them disconnected. And I say sometimes I tell people, you have to go back to the younger version of you before yeah. things fell apart. Sometimes you can rewind to the childhood and go... I remember this version of life where I had nothing but hopes and dreams. Sometimes you have to use that narrative of, I remember that person yeah. and charting yourself back to go, I know I'm supposed to be a much more beautiful person before my wife left me or my husband left me or, or all of the things I put my hands on broke and the things that I was trying fell apart and now I'm stuck without and I'm trying to make it and I feel like a failure. Go back to the person, use the language of that person that yeah. was just playing football or doing jump rope on the playground that felt like the world was their oyster. Sometimes you have to remind yourself, that's actually who I am. My experiences have programmed me and given me a personality that maybe is pointing in a wrong direction. Get reconnected with the beautiful version that you remember yourself as. That's, that's in essence, going back to the point of divide, mm. right? You can chase it back on a specific subject, specific issue, or you yep. can find your way back to... 
where it just seemed like so, so life was so much easier. Right? Yeah. So in essence, you're, you're finding your way back to the point of divide. Yeah. When that essence shifted and became something else. Really quickly, yeah. one, of my, uh, one of my clients, she's amazing. She is, I'm not gonna go through all our accolades, um, but she has so many. We got to a point in a, in a coaching conversation where we recognized that as we go back to that seven, eight, nine year old girl who was just gonna tackle the world and was on fire to do it and was just so happy. I mean, life was happy. And this, yeah. is, a, this is a common theme, whatever the age of divide is, common theme of happy, yeah. smiling, yeah, laughter. Yeah, yeah. And we tracked it all, and, and in short, what we were able to come down to was she had accomplished everything she wanted to accomplish. She had accolades she didn't oh, even expect wow. to have, yeah. but it all went in the path of, holy cow, you saw this yeah. before it unfolded. Yeah. And recognizing, yes, I, I'm, I'm right here as an adult woman living yeah. the life that I saw as a yeah. little girl. I'm like, all right, great, because I know why she's talking to me, right? Yeah. Great, so let's go back to that little girl. If you're given the choice, Everything in your heart, yeah. you're going to live out, but you're going to live it out with absolutely no emotional attachment or reciprocal joy or enthusiasm for it at all. Yeah. Or you have no clue what it's going to be. It could be exactly what you want, or it could be something totally different. Yeah. Doesn't matter, but you're going to be alive. You're going to be full of joy, enthusiasm, sure. and you're going to have emotional connection to yeah. every day you live. Yeah. Which one would you choose? Yeah. And that was the break point. Wow. It was just the, we found the point of divide yeah. and emotion poured. Yeah, wow. We don't, nobody chooses to go through life getting everything they want with a complete detachment from it and no emotional reality yeah. that they're actually alive. Right? Yeah. That's yeah. one of our mottos in the club is get alive, yeah. right? So just want to throw that out there because it was highly relevant. That, sure. that chasing yeah. it back to childhood, the point of divide, yeah. and then recognizing all this stuff that we think we're doing because it's what we want. Do we actually feel the emotions of joy and enthusiasm yeah. and agape, love for life, right? Yeah. Um, so back to how do, they find, how do they find you? How do they find you? You know, I was really good at promoting and, and having people find me early on in my career when I was in development. And uh, I've become less so, especially with the club, because when I went with social media, we got overwhelmed real quick. Yeah. Um, you know, basically, there are two ways. From the from the Adventure Club standpoint, you know, what you see on the logo there, A-D-V-C-L-B, uh, Juddy, that's my name, J-U-D-D-Y, at A-D-V-C-L-B, right there. Yeah. Juddy at A-D-V-C-L-B dot com. That's my email for that. My email for the coaching component, what I do professionally, is Juddy at heartperformance dot com. Okay. That's the professional side. The Adventure Club is the, the fun side. So those sure. two emails, you know, I, I don't have a social media presence. Yeah. I don't like to publish the websites and this, that, and the other. Right now, it's very direct. I control the gate. Um, Juddy at ADVCLB. If it's about Baja and adventures and whew, having one heck of an experience or yeah. Juddy at heartperformance.com. If it's about, hey, I'm leading in business and in life and, yeah. and I feel like there's a way I could be doing it not just better, but more alive. Yeah, come on, man. I love it. I would say, lastly, thank you for taking the time to share with the world, right? With whoever will see this video. Uh, and, you know, thank you, whoever's watching the video, for taking the time. If you made it this far, uh, it's because whatever content we provided was valuable and you found that you were able to connect to it. Uh, and wherever this video lands, there will be an opportunity for you to comment, to connect with us. Uh, and if you're looking for Juddy, uh, you're looking just to get some feedback, please connect there. Listen, connect with Adventure Club, guys. I think that uh, I think you guys are really on to some, something uh, different and something unique, but not, not in a weird way, but for so much of the United States, the people that, we, that grew up like we did, that this is a way for us to do what you do well, but to push the limits, uh, get out of your space, and then to really be able to grow. Uh, as a father or as a mother or just as an individual, as a business person, to really s expose the, the cracks in a safe place with somebody that can help. Uh, all the meanwhile, having an absolute blast with you guys down there. Uh, and those looking for coaching opportunities, uh, he, you know, Juddy provided you the email address. Connect with Juddy. Uh, reach out. Listen, you've obviously heard some dynamic thoughts here. You know why I said earlier on that, that it would be great conversation because the thought life that you live in is amazing. 
And uh, but thank you, thank you for taking the time, and I appreciate you, brother. <laughs> thank you, dude. This was yes, a blast. Yes, sir. Yeah, this thank was you blast. so much. You know, bro. I don't, I don't do stuff like this very often, yeah. right? I'm, I'm very one on one. Yes, so. sir. Yeah, that's why I broke you out. But of this it. was fun. <laughs> Thanks, Eddie.